It is good to see you this morning at Southfield. One of the, um, I think, beautiful privileges we have every week as we enter uh, this room is to be led in worship by, by worship leaders that are proficient and skilled in their musical ability, but also just constantly moving their hearts toward God. And the songs that we're going to be singing this morning, I, I want you to, you know, even more than normal, clue into the words, the messages of these songs today are profound. And as we, we move into the first one in particular, it's that song, Another in the Fire, that, that idea, that beautiful moment where these three men are supposed to be being consumed by the angry flames of King Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar looks in and goes, oh my word, I thought I threw in three guys. They're supposed to be gone. Instead, there's been an addition. There's one more than there was before. And I think that story and so many in the Bible call attention to the fact that there are spiritual realities happening all around us all the time, and we are completely unaware of them. We are unaware. We don't see the angels filling this room right now. We're unaware of the spiritual battles that are happening just beyond the veil. We're not always aware when we enter church that we are in the presence of God. God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. You thought you just came to church. No, you came today to be in the presence of the, of the living God. And so would you enter into singing today, not just, oh, that's a pretty song, or I love that one, but absorb the message, absorb the message, live into it. Let's stand and sing. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me was another in the waters holding back the seas and should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire Dead, left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning? Either way, I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I set me free, there is a grave that holds nobody. And now the power lives in me. There is another in the fire. Oh, 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 and I can see the light in the darkness as the dark. To him, I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where it's thin. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls gave in. Nothing stands between us, nothing stands between There is no other name but 
with the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in this phrase between all the things unseen in this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. in the fire standing next to me there'll be another in the waters holding back the seas should I ever need reminding how good you've been to me I'll count the joy from every battle cause I know that's where you'll be and I can see the the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's thin i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls gave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between there'll be another in the fire standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy from every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be Like the promised on a Winter comes for a storm Oh, how nature awaits us with a nature of patience, like a seed in the snow. I've been and I believe that my season will come. Lord, I think. Thank you. 
Sometimes, God, the winter is it's so harsh, it's so long that it feels like punishment. It feels like we've just been forgotten by you. And it's just the opposite. It's not a forgetting, but it's a loving in a whole new way. A loving that recognizes that the winter is necessary if there's going to be a beautiful harvest. And so we hold on and we wait. Not in despair, but in hope. Believing our season will come. Thank you, God, for being a God who is willing to allow your children to endure winter. I know as a dad, it's the hardest thing my kids go through hard things. But you do it because you love us. And we are grateful. We don't always say it. We don't even always think it. But we are grateful. Thank you, Father God. Amen. You have a seat. <clears throat> First Sunday of a new year first Sunday of a new decade, and not any decade, 2020. I mean, I can remember as a kid, 1972, living in the, sitting in the living room at 535 Locust Street. Noon hits, the Jetsons come on. We were on Eastern Time. The Jetsons come on, and I'd watch those, those flying cars and flying dogs and flying kids, and you didn't have to eat a meal. You just pressed, and you got a meal pill. Boop, and you were good to go. I mean, all this great stuff, and it was coming. 2020, it would be there, man. We were ready to go. Well, we don't have the flying car quite yet, although we're getting closer. But boy, the things we have now are just amazing. There are things now that I could never have imagined, ever imagined as a kid, or for that matter, in 2010. It's amazing, the advances. My phone actually works in this room. My goodness, it's not a paperweight anymore. So much has happened over the course of a decade. You come to 2020, and I mean, come on, you hear 2020, and you can't help but think of eyesight, right? It's there. This is, this is a sermon that's been waiting for every pastor. We have sat for the past 30 years going, 2020's coming. I know this one. This, uh, this one's easy. You've got to talk about vision. So I, I looked at this whole concept this week of 2020 vision. I wanted to understand it better because for me, I always thought of 2020 vision as perfect vision. Well, if you go on and read Google, other places, they'll say it's not perfect vision. I don't know if they're trying to make the people with bad vision feel good, kind of a politically correct vision thing or something like that. But, but the bottom line is it's not perfect vision. What it means is that you have visual acuity. Now, if you have 2020 visual acuity, you can see the little words way up there that say visual acuity. This literally is the sharpness of your vision. How sharp is your vision? Are the edges all nice and neat, or is it kind of fuzzy? Do you just see blobs kind of moving toward you and wait for them to talk so you know who it is? What's your vision like? What's the sharpness of your vision? How well can you see? And then I want to move this over to, to our realm, and i got to look at it up here. It's too hard down there. Whoop, went too far. Visual acuity. What is the sharpness of your spiritual vision? How well do you see with your spiritual eye? This is what I want to encourage us on as we, as we move into this new year and into this new decade. How well do you see with your spiritual eyes? Do you live with spiritual mindedness? You look at life through spiritual eyes. You see, you see, you're able to see the way God sees. You're able to see or at least get a glimpse at what God sees. Not just, not just what everybody else sees, but, but you're getting a glimpse of what God sees. There are so many different types of vision. 
I want to go through a few just to compare them to spiritual vision. One is earthbound vision. I think the majority of people in our time, in our age, have earthbound vision. They see here and now, they see the physical, they see what is, and they don't even really believe that there's something beyond that. The material is what matters. When they talk about spiritual, it's about hugging a tree or kissing a whale. It's not about God. It's not about all of that. It's just it, because that's not there. What is is what is, what I can see, feel, and touch. And so we live like squirrels running around, gathering our acorns and getting big mounded and taking advantage of all those acorns we can because then we're going to die and someone else will inherit the acorns. I've got to enjoy life now. And we live all of life in light of that vision in light of the way we see the world others have more of an egocentric vision everything is viewed in light of how it impacts me how it affects me what is this going to mean for me it doesn't matter what it will mean for the family for the workplace for the community for the church for anyone else everything is always read through how will this touch me if we were to look at their solar system they are the sun and we were to look at their universe, they are the center of their universe. Everything, every thought is always coming back to, what about me? How does this impact me? What ultimately will happen to me? There's a little bit of a twist on this, but it really is quite different. Another is a victim-driven vision. A victim-driven vision is the type that just sees the entire universe as out to get you. Everybody else wins, you don't. Everybody else, good things happen to them, not you. You are, you are consistently living in a place of defeat. Always, you, you, you never get the advantage. You never get ahead. Everything is always against you. Now, i got to admit, a little piece of this is well-developed in me. I grew up a Buffalo Bills fan, you know? They did it again yesterday. I mean, how in the world do you take that lead and go, oh, no, we want to go home? I mean, I don't get it. I really don't. I had a few people text me. I'm like, I stopped investing my heart in that team years ago. It just hurts too much. But I promise you, if you're a Buffalo fan, a Cleveland fan, whatever it is, you know your team's going to lose. And if you're a New England fan, you know your team's going to lose. <laughs> Finally. Anyway. <clears throat> No, some of us just live in that victim place. Everything is about the way the universe is out to get us. But God calls us to, be, to have a spiritually minded vision. To see everything that's happening around me through spiritual eyes. To actually try to see the world, to see my world, to see what I'm going through, through the eyes of God. Not through the eyes of being merely earthbound and there is no God. Not through the eyes of ego that says, what about me? Not through the eyes of victimization, but to see things the way God sees them. That's what I want to encourage you to work on this January. To start looking and trying to see that thing that you just thought was you, you getting hit in the head again. Where was God in that? The thing that you thought, but what about me? Where is God in that? That moment that you thought, I, I just thought this was going to work. Where is God in that? Now, the song we just sang, I got to tell you, does a great job giving us an example of what spiritual vision looks like. To be able to just look at nature to be able to look at an aspect of nature and see the working of God in it. That's what it means to have spiritual eyes, to literally look at any. You can look at anything and you can find God's involvement in it. So he just sang these words, right? Like the frost of a rose, winter comes to us all. Oh, how nature acquaints us with the nature of patience. That is seeing life through spiritual eyes. To be able to look at nature and go, I'm learning lessons about God. I'm learning lessons about me. I'm learning lessons about life in God by just watching the world around me. And the choice that they make is to look at these beautiful trees, sequoias. 
Uh, it's funny, I've had a few people ask, what's that sequoia thing? Is that like some hidden Greek word? No, it's, it's a monster tree. They don't grow around here. They grow mostly in California, though they're found in a few other places as well. And they are just massive. They are huge. They're enormous and beautiful. I've never seen one in person. And I think after this song, it kind of moved on a bucket list. At some point, we're going to go check out these trees. But I, I thought it'd be good. I'm going to just show you a, a clip here, National Geographic clip. The, you have this group that was working on taking images, pictures of a sequoia so that you could get this beautiful head-on image. And they, and they throw in some facts along the way, so absorb this. We know that th there are trees that have bigger trunks. But when you add up all of the wood beside the main trunk, all of the limbs, all of the branches, all of the biomass above the ground, this tree is likely the biggest. The reason we want to do these portraits, people get it. They, when they see the tree in its totality, without distortion, they gasp. Oh man, looks good. I'm gonna cry. catch one of the facts because you're thinking can you pay to do that climb up the tree thing that's amazing I mean think about it 27 feet across 247 feet high 2 billion leaves and that particular tree 3200 years old you want to get some perspective it was a sapling when Moses walked the earth that's an old tree I mean England likes to brag about their old stuff. <laughs> we have a 3,200-year-old tree. We beat them, yeah. They're big, and they're old. Think of all the winters that tree has endured. Think of all the droughts, all the disease that came through all the different seasons. Think of all it has endured, and it's lasted for 3,200 years. It's got the thickest bark of any tree, two feet thick at the base, two feet thick. And that bark contains tannin, which causes it to be immune to most of the diseases that take out all other trees. God gave it just what it needed in order for it to continue to grow high and long. That thick bark, no pitch or resin, like a pine tree and others, so it's less likely to burn quickly in a fire. It needs the extremes of frigid winter and arid drought. If it's planted in a place that only has summer, it will die. If it has only winter, it will die. It needs both of the extremes. It needs the snowpack because it needs a lot of water. In fact, there's a point in the season that the water can't even get up the tree anymore, and God designed this tree so that the leaves actually water the highest parts of the tree. It's amazing but it also needs arid drought. The, the roots literally need to dry out completely every season for that tree to continue to survive. It needs both. Do you think it is possible that we need both winter and drought in order to grow spiritually? Do you think, do you think God wants us to see something here? I can see the promise. I can see the future. You're the God of seasons, and I'm just in the winter. Here I am. I'm in the winter. If all I know of harvest is that it's worth my patience, then if you're not done working, God, I'm not done waiting. That's spiritual vision. 
not to say, would you hurry the winner up? But to say, if this is what it takes to have the far harvest that you long for, I'm not done waiting. I'm with you, God. That's spiritual vision. This tree needs fire to survive. It needs it. It, it, it's crazy. It clears the brush and the debris down at the bottom, and when, after that fire happens, it creates nutrient-rich ash. For many years, conservationists did everything they could to protect these trees from fire. And what were they doing? They were stopping the tree from being able to reproduce. It needed the ash down below. Here's something else that's amazing about them. They need the fire because the fire opens the pine cone. And these cones can sit for 20 years with the seed in them. And when the heat of fire comes, the cone opens and the seeds scatter into the ground. Without the fire, it's not going to happen. It needs the fire. It needs the heat. Is it possible that you need some fire in your life? That you need some heat in your life in order for life to be released? In order for new life to happen once again? But what do we want, God? My life, here's my order. I'll take one life, no fire, no winter, no heat, no drought, just San Diego. Please give me, San Di give me a San Diego spirituality. Okay, whatever. Man, tiny seed. Think about it. Huge tree, tiny. You expect the seed to be like, boom, okay, let's plant a sequoia. 91,000 seeds per pound. And yet this tree casts off 300 to 400,000 seeds per year, each tree. You can see my promise even in the winter because you're the God of greatness even in a manger for all I know of seasons is that you take your sweet old time that's what the seasons teach us, right? God, you take your time. You could have saved us in a second, but instead you sent a child. Have you ever thought long and hard about that one? Why didn't God go salvation? Boom. Why? Why a baby? Why 30 years of waiting before he even begins his public ministry? Why the waiting? Instead of saving us in a second, you sent an infant and made us wait and, and wait and wait for our ultimate salvation. See that seedling sequoia? That's the size of the president's sequoia when Moses walked the earth. Crazy, isn't it? The lessons that we can learn from just looking around us, looking at life through spiritual eyes. See, I think most of us would say, in tree world, I want to be a sequoia. Not many of us go, I want to be bamboo. We, you know, I want to be a sequoia. I want to be an oak. I want to be one of those sturdy trees that lasts for hundreds and thousands of years and is strong. Well... That requires harsh winters and droughts and fires and all kinds of things that we say, please know God. Well, do you want to be a sequoia or not? When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. That's what this song is saying. You want to be a sequoia? All that tough stuff, welcome it as a friend. Realize that they come to test your faith and produce in you the quality of endurance, but let the process go until that endurance is fully developed. I want to encourage you this year to look at life with spiritual eyes. Look at your spouse with spiritual eyes. Look at your boss, your underlings, Look at your drive to work with spiritual eyes. What do you see when you're willing to see it through God's eyes? Now, how in the world do we nurture spiritual mindedness? There are a lot of ways to do it, but, but I want to bring you to one, especially since it's the, the first day of the year and it's something we've talked about in the past. I like to nurture spiritual mindedness through, through choosing a word for the year. I gave up on resolutions about 50 pounds ago. 
I just, you know, most of you, I'm in January 5th. You're done, right? But a word, a word. You bring a word with you into your year, and you know there are times you'll even forget about your word, but then the word will come back again. It, it comes back again, and you go, oh yeah, that word. And, and it has a way of helping me to see, maybe not through all of the vision God is trying to expose me to, but at least an aspect. There's at least something that I'm seeing. When I first started this a few years back with some friends, I was coming into 2016, and it was going to be an incredible year. Uh, Brian was about to marry Riley. Uh, it was some of the final time of Kim's dad's life on this earth. Nate was about to go off to school and explore Texas. All this stuff was coming. And as I moved into all the things of that year, and, and including just enjoying being in this place after a long wait, I said, savor. Savor is a great word. And it helped me to look at all the beautiful blessings that God brings into my life, and I just, I just want to enjoy them and savor them. A few years later, I went with another word, be with. That's two words, I know I cheated. Be with. And with be with, it was just, I wanted, I wanted to make sure that I spent more time just lingering with people. And it was strange in that year because here I was talking be with, and it's the year Kim's dad left this earth. It's the year the Aubreys moved away. There were, there were, these, there were these, these departures going on, and I'm like, I, wait a second, be with us. You all can't leave. I, you, wait, how in the world am I supposed to be with you if you're leaving me? Talked to a friend about it, and you know, she said, is it possible that you would start seeing this through the eyes of God instead of your own? In what way does God want to be with you in the midst of separation from other humans, and I went, oh, yeah. This, this word is supposed to help me to see things through spiritual eyes. It's not just some goal, you know, my word for the year, candy. Good, I'm going to buy more candy or something like that. You know, it, it's, it's, supposed to, it's supposed to have some, some beauty that, that stretches and challenges me to see, the life, see life through God's eyes. Why a word? Well, I think I just gave you some reasons for it, but one of the main reasons I think comes down to that idea that resolutions don't seem to work very well. But to have a word that you can walk with, journey with, with God, it can have incredible power and impact. I've had a number of friends that took this on this year, and coming out of that, coming out of that season, they can see the way that they see life differently through the eyes of God because of the particular word that they chose. Now, one of the questions I guess that is important to ask is, is this biblical? Because let's face it, we should be doing things that are biblical. You're not going to find a command in the Bible, Hezekiah 317, find a word for the year. You're not going to find that. It's not there, okay? But I think the concept is clearly there in the word of God. I, I can see again and again where there was a word that inspired a season for an individual or for the people of God. Genesis 39 you have Joseph going through a season where everything is being torn away from him. He's being rejected by his brothers, rejected by practically everybody he works for, never fails. He's being pushed away. And what does God say about him? The Lord was with Joseph. He needed to remember that word with. He needed to hear that, that withness of God. He was with him in whatever happened in his life. That word was important for him. I suspect Pharaoh had a word for the year, a little sentence, let my people go. He kept hearing it and hearing it and resisting it and hearing it. You can see all the times it's referenced. It was an important statement during that season. Deuteronomy 30, 19, Moses is right toward the end of his life. The sequoia is now about this tall. You know, it's, it's growing, but Moses is about to die. Today I've given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and cursings. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. About 25 times in Deuteronomy, Moses says, you'll need to choose, choose, choose. Important word for them in that season. You come to the season of Joshua, and what does God say to him? I, for crying aloud, say three verses in a row. Be strong and courageous. 
Be strong and very courageous. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I suspect he had that plaque on his wall in his tent. Be strong and courageous. Oh, you have the prophets. Repent. You have the disciples receiving the word from Jesus. Go. Philippians, that letter from Paul. Joy, rejoice. We just went through James. Faith, 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 faith. You'll see these theme words that run through. Even for individuals, David, he heard the word beloved when he heard his name. I'm the beloved of God. John, the disciple Jesus loved. He needed to hear that. Peter, he needed to hear rock because there were times that his legs got really shaky. How does the word work? Well, you can choose one for you personally. You could choose one for your family. We have families in this church that have actually chosen a, a family word and walked with that word through the years, you, through the year. You can choose one for a community, maybe a small group you're a part of. We chose one as a church last year. We, used, we chose look up, and we were, we were pressing in communion those ideas of looking up to God in prayer, looking up and seeing what he had to say in scripture, looking up from our stupid phones and realizing there was a human in the room, so let's take some time to connect with them instead of tweeting while we're in the presence of human beings. Look up. Look up. How do you choose a word? Well, it's pressed on us by the Spirit of God. You just, you just find yourself kind of, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a, a, a gnawing, a slow just a rumble in there. You, you can sense that, that God is taking you in a direction. The word is both inspirational and aspirational. It requires a stretch. It's, it's usually not easy. In fact, it's, it may even be something that when you hear the word, you want to you resist it a little bit. This word, if lived into, and if lived into well, is transformative. We will be different because of having lived into the word. And, as we've been saying, it clarifies spiritual vision. You see something about life. You see something about life in God. You see something about your path in this spiritual journey differently than you ever did before because you journeyed with that word. How do you arrive at the word? Well, prayer and listening. Now, admittedly, for a lot of us, we do our word work last year so that when January 1st arrives, we can go, here's my word, and I'm ready to go. For most people, December is a touch busy, and there's no rule on it. It has to be January 1st, or you have to wait till next year. And so I'd encourage you to enter into a season, a short season of just asking, God, what word might you give me this year that will help me to see through spiritual eyes, to be spiritually minded, instead of earthbound, instead of ego-driven, instead of victimized, how can I see through the eyes of God? Then we come to our word. What's a word for us that we can walk into this year as a church family? So I've been pressed a lot by um, the, the Southfield photo booth. You know where it is? Yeah, you go out in the hallway, and you got that beautiful tree that, that Sherry and Jim constructed, that, that cross that came from, from logs in the back of their, in the, toward the back of their uh, yard. The words there that we walk up to and we see every time we walk into this place, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. When's the last time you looked for God wholeheartedly? You're like, well, I'm at church. Yeah, so what? I mean, seriously, you could have you just got the best hour nap of your life. I, I don't know. Are you wholehearted in what you're doing right now? Or, or is your body here and your head golfing? If you look for me wholeheartedly, you'll find me. The New International Version and the English Standard Version both word it the same way, but differently from this one. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Do you seek God? Do you seek him? I think for a lot of us, we just kind of expect, I don't know, maybe God will throw a star in the sky, I'll know where to go. Do you seek him? Do you wrestle with God to know who he is? 
and to know his desires for your life. Are you wholeheartedly into this, looking for God, seeking God? And, I, and as I was pressed with it, I just, I couldn't, God wouldn't take away this word, seek, seek, seek. And by the way, when you saw the word seek, you also saw something else. You saw the date change to 2030, to 10 years from now. Imagine 10 years from now, some of you go, I, no, thank you, I don't want to. I, 10 years from now, we're going to be different. Look at this front row. 10 years from now, most of you will have graduated from college if you're going to go. Nate, you won't be graduated. I mean, you'll be 32. You'll be two years older than Brian is right now. You guys, 15, 16, 17, 18, 25, 26, 27, 28. Some of you will be married. Some of you will have babies. I mean, it's crazy. Ten years from now, some of you out here, you're going to be limping more than you do right now. <laughs> Where will we be as a church ten years from now? Now, admittedly, I've said this before. I'm not real big on, you know, let's set a vision. I, I've seen churches, and it works for some, where they set this grand vision. They have all these things they're going to do, and sometimes it feels a little audacious, and sometimes it just feels like a bunch of spaghetti flung on the wall. Let's see what we can hit. I think it's a lot more important and honestly a lot harder to work on our values than our vision. What's important, and are we going to become what's important? And when we become what's important, a beautiful vision grows out of it. I'll tell you what, God's grown us into something amazing and beautiful. I, I've had an experience of this recently. We had this great Christmas program. It was awesome. And what was not only awesome is the way the kids performed and everything else, but the way all the adults and everybody worked together to make it happen. And it took me back to literally the first Christmas program and the last in 1995, six months after I came here. Six months after I came here, there was a Christmas program. We had these little handbell knocker things, and, and so they got up and played this song, and at the end, nobody knew what the song was, and so the girl had to stand up and say, that was Joy to the World, and everybody went, oh. And we knew now that it was Joy to the World. And so, you know, that was what I remembered for the longest time, and then, and then as I thought about it a little bit more, I had this moment that I realized, oh my word, that program was the first program that somebody came up and just ripped the flesh off me at that church. Let me know I was stupid, I was young, I was inexperienced, I didn't have a clue. And I remember that night going, oh, honeymoon over. It was vicious. And the vicious lasted for a few seasons. Who are we now? What happened here? and out there, and out there, and all the places he, things were made and brought together was beautiful, not because of a lofty vision, but because we're living into our values. And so I ask you, as we think about the next 10 years, how is God going to take the values we've embraced and embodied and grow us into whatever his beautiful vision is for us? We need to spend some time seeking the face of God. Asking God, God, we, you've given us great resources, you've given us great opportunities, what in the world do you want us to do? What is your calling on us? Where are you taking us, God? Now I want to back up a little bit and, and look at these verses in reverse. That's verse 13. Verse 12, then you will call upon me, and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. How do we know God? How do we seek God? How do we know his desires and his direction? It's through praying. It's through talking to him. Not just as individuals, but as a group. It's through talking to him and seeking his face and his desires. We need a season of prayer. And yes, even fasting where we just come to God and say, God, what do you want? And you know what I love? I love that if, if this gang here is part of this church 10 years from now, and I know some of them are going to move and whatever, 10 years from now, they will remember that we started this decade not launching some grand initiative, but getting on our knees and saying, God, we're seeking you. 
We're seeking you with our whole hearts. We keep falling backward, and of course, you come to the verse everybody knows. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And this is the reality of what God wants for his people. He wants to expose to us his plans, his desires, but more importantly, he wants to expose himself to us. He wants us to know him. It's not just seeking, God, what do you want us to do, but God, who are you? And who are we supposed to be in light of who you are? Go back another verse. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill, and I will fulfill to you my promise and I will bring you back to this place. What we're looking for is not what we're going to do, but what God is going to do. We're looking to embrace what God wants to do. For them, they were, they, they were stuck in Babylon waiting to come home. I don't feel like we're stuck in Babylon right now. But where we are is where we are right now. That's where you start a spiritual movement, where you are right now. And so, for 2020, we're going to take on the word seek, and we're going to seek God collectively. God, I want to know you better. I want to know your desire for my life. I want to I want to know your desire for our church collectively. Where are you taking us, God? So we'll move to communion in just a couple minutes. Two tables at the side, two at the back, gluten-free on either side, church. And as you do, I want you to start thinking about where you might go with prayer and with fasting. And here's what we're going to do. I love this. Um, the devotional guide was designed by a person who is very much in love with churches and our church. And it's a, it's a guide called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting, a fasting guide for spiritual breakthroughs. And I'm, I want you to get this today. So actually, when you come up to get communion, you're going to leave with a book. There are books up here at either side. There's a table right in front of Bob at the soundboard for those at the back. If, you, if, you're, if you're thinking, you know what? I want to be in on this with this church family. Take one of these. It's yours, free. Only take it if you think you're going to use this. Or you know what? Take it even if you won't use it, and if you decide during the week after you pray about it and think about it, you think, no, God doesn't want me to pray and fast, bring it back, Okay? he talks about different kinds of fasts. Some of you fasting, you just think, oh, that isn't, isn't that what Yodas do? You know, old, old spiritual dried up people, I don't fast. I just kind of wonder how much we're missing out on because we don't do what the old spiritual Yodas do. He talks about different kinds of fasting, full fast, where, you, you know, 21 days you're just not going to eat. Probably would not recommend that. Daniel fast, only vegetables, fruit, partial fast, where maybe there's a meal that you say, I'm not going to eat. Um, what, maybe just a day during each of those three weeks. And then the one that's probably harder for a lot of us is the comfort fast, where there's something in our lives that we just like. It makes life better, and we're going to put it aside for 21 days. I want you to, during communion, to start thinking about would I be willing to participate in some aspect of a fast? We're not going to declare the same thing for everybody, but would you be willing to pray and fast and seek the face of God with us? And it really comes down to that word. Are you, are you willing to at least be open to it? And if you're willing, take a book. I know some of you have, have kids in the room and you're, you're already, oh, Dennis, you did it again. Now I'm going to have to fight with my kid over the book. You know, you can take a peek, and if, if you have, at seven years old, I would have done this. All right? God's given us some beautifully spiritually minded kids. 
And he's given us some 60-year-olds that are flaky. You know, he's, got, he's given us everything. <laughs> I'm almost 60, I can say that. Some 57-year-olds that are flaky. <clears throat> but what might God do if we sought his face wholeheartedly? Not just this week, this month, this year, but in 2029. The prayers you pray now will impact 2029. Think about that. What we're living right now grows out of the prayers that people prayed in 1910, 20, and 30. Think about that. So, for the next minute, at least say, God, I'm willing, or no thanks, God. And then move to communion and get one of the books and go back to your seat. Now, during this, I'm going to play a little different video than normal. This isn't a music video or something like that. This is a video of a Bible teacher we've talked about in the past, Dallas Willard. And he's talking about the last two psalms in the Bible. And the reason I'm playing it today is because he keeps coming back to a word. It's, it's a possible word. It's a word you might choose to take on for the year personally. It's kind of funny. He's clearly talking to a group. He cracks a few jokes along the way. So it just kind of flow with it. But, but hear the way he uses a word. So let's be quiet with God right now. your head or in your heart or even softly with your lips as you come forward to communion today and you're willing to participate in this just say God I am willing I am willing I want to recommend to you that you have a look at these last psalms and they're just wonderful words here the last psalms are are all praise psalms basically addressing the kingdom and how the kingdom is present. And I recommend that you try to get in a situation where you can read these out loud. And uh, now you might do that at the mall because, you know, people talking on uh, cell phones and they just think you're talking on a cell phone. <laughs> We used to think there was something wrong with people talking to themselves, but no more. So you might do this at the mall. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all stars of light. Now you can walk about as you do that. You might even be tempted to dance a little bit. Billy Bray, an old Methodist of a hundred and some years ago, uh, was a simple uh, lay preacher. And he was always happy. And he could hardly keep his feet from skipping. And he would say out of the blue, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And, of course, people always wanted to shut him down. He said, if you put me in a barrel, I'd shout glory out the bunghole. <laughs> That's it. Is praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters and all the deeps. I love the monsters. I love elephants. How can you not praise God when you see an elephant? I think of that whale. You know that they run on the insurance ad. It's always jumping up and flopping over. I think every time he does that, he says, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy, stormy winds, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Wonderful praise. The last psalm is where I think the psalmist just sort of runs out of wind and has to call for help. Uh, right? So he has a trumpet to help him. 
Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him for his mighty deeds. So you, you bring that before you. And you see, all, oh, this is God. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. There. Salsa. <laughs> right? <laughs> Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Just crashing. Ugh. Yes, praise him with resounding symbols, ones that keep echoing after you whack them. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Just a word like praise. It, you know, it just doesn't have to be limited to praising the Lord. Maybe you need to raise the amount of praise that you give other people in your life. And so, and so that word can just be used in multiple ways. Our servers are coming now to receive the offering. As they do, a few announcements for you. Refuge and Revive are, are back on. Anything yeah. that we need to know out of the ordinary? Nothing too crazy. Just a couple of really cool series that we're going to be starting um, tonight at Revive with high schoolers. We're going to be talking about uh, a one, the series is called 180, where we're, we're not looking at setting a resolution. We're literally looking at drastic life change in certain areas of our lives, which is going to be really cool. And Refuge, we're going to start up another episode series where we're diving into real Bible stories where we hope that those messages sink in to the point of memorization. So really cool stuff. That, that link to coming events will take you to all the things that are going on around here in the future. It will also give you an initial peek at what's going on with groups for the winter. So uh, that, that season is upon us. Yeah. wanted to talk about this a little bit before we leave. So now that you have the, the book in your hand, you can see on page 8 where it talks about the different kinds of fasts there are. But, but if you just look at that 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 during the week, what we're going to be doing. I mean, he talks about literally writing down some specific goals. What are things that, as you seek God and, and pray to God, where, what are some areas in your own life, not just church life, that, that you're looking for a breakthrough? You're just looking for God to, to bust up some hard ground that's been hard for a long time. So I, I want you to go ahead and, you know, read through basically the first 11, 11 up to page 11. And uh, it talks about, why to do a fast, what a fast is, all that sort of thing. You had a chance to peek at the first few pages. Anything stick out to you? Yeah, I was looking at the open, well, Feast feast on the Word of God, number three on page nine. I, I am sure I'm like a lot of you, I eat reflexively, and I do other things, like I pop up my phone during commercial breaks reflexively, and there was a, a period in my life where I, I noticed that the social media content I was following, and I, I was letting everything just bring me down, but I was still going back to it. And I just kept consuming and consuming and consuming. And literally, I mean, that was affecting my relationship with my wife. It was, it was damaging relationships with friendships. I was being more harsh with, with the kids that I work with. And it was just, it was bad. So I, uh, I was actually talking with Bob. This is like two years ago. Um, I, I put the, the Bible app, the Uversion app, in a more prominent spot on my phone. So that, and I told myself, when I open up my phone, instead of going straight to Instagram or straight to Twitter, where it's just a black hole of <laughs> garbage, I said, before I do anything, I'm, I'm going to hit the app. I'm not a big plan person, so I, I know I love watching how everybody else does their plans. For me, sometimes it's just that quick, I need, I need to see the Word of God. So maybe it's just the, the, wor the uh, verse of the day, where I'll just catch that, and it, it totally, it, that, you know, we're talking about vision. It transforms how I saw, or it transformed how I saw everything. And that led to, I'm not perfect, uh, it led to over 350 days in the Bible app last year, just because I told myself, the reflexive nature of this, you know, open, opening my life before God, I wanted to literally open God first and, and change, you know, change literally how I was going about my days. So, Thanks for sharing yeah. that. So that, that's really, that is incredibly helpful. Um, I think that when, when I'm going to launch into something like this with a group, my personality is the type that I, I need a little lead time. 
I like, I like to get the book ahead of time. If I got it today and knew we were starting tomorrow, I'd be like all antsy because I want to I wanna peek and see it. So I hand it out this week for the antsy people. And the rest of you, you'll probably pick it up sometime next Monday and say, yeah, we're doing this thing. But if you can, if you can just start to prepare the soil of your heart by looking at those 11 pages, that'll give you an idea of where we're going. So I want you to stand. And we're going to close with one more of the beautiful songs that we added last year that, that looks at life through spiritual eyes. We tend to look at our life through our circumstances instead of looking through the eyes of God. And the eyes of God say, what you're enduring is for ultimate good because I am good and I want good for you. So let's praise the goodness of God together.
so God, we know that you hear our prayer. We open ourselves right now to you to say, God, we want to do this. Not just one or two of us. As a church, we want to do this. We want to seek you. We want to seek you wholeheartedly. We want to, we want to seek you the way we do when we can't find our phone. And we scramble and we rush and we drive back and we search and, and oh my word, what are we going to do? Oh, if we would have the same intensity searching for you that we do for something that we've lost that is valuable to us. Open yourself to us in fresh and new ways as we are willing to approach you in fresh and new ways. We love you. We love your goodness. Open our eyes, God. Please open our eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week.